The Cascade Crest goes all the way from Canada down to Oregon. This is an old growth forest ecosystem that's in the rain shadow of the Cascade Crest. We are very fortunate because we have connected, protected land, whether it's national parks, national forests, wilderness, or tribal lands. In the early 90s, we were recognizing that we had a problem as far as the traffic volumes going up on the interstate and becoming a barrier to the movement of wildlife. There was a risk that species would become isolated, particularly in the South Cascades, between the Columbia River Gorge, where Washington and Oregon come together, and I-90. You have species like wolverine, or black bears, or mountain lions, that have very large home ranges. Reconnecting habitats and species is critically important to maintaining viable populations in the future. We had this great opportunity in about 1999 to start collaborating with DOT because they really needed to modify the highway, go from four to six lanes and fix a lot of safety issues. The I-90 project really started out as a way to reduce road closures due to avalanches. And from the department's aspect, we started looking at other things such as deteriorated concrete pavement, capacity issues. We discovered this whole other aspect that we needed to address as part of this project, one of it being wildlife connectivity. This was an opportunity to create a win-win, fix things for transportation, and also fix things for wildlife connectivity. The I-90 Sequoia Pass East project is a 15-mile corridor project. Right now, we're about halfway, about seven and a half miles. But we started phase one near Hayak, around Lake Ketchless. We created a wider structure at Gold Creek that allows Lake Ketchless to back up underneath the bridge and connect with wetlands that were cut off by the roadway. We have multiple undercrossing structures that not only allow additional lanes for the traveling public to cross, but also for wildlife to cross underneath the roadway to get to Lake Ketchless or to another side of the highway without being hit. We have avalanche bridges now that allow the snow to go underneath the roadway and set it onto the roadway. So in phase two is where we built this big signature structure that you see behind me. This crossing structure here is the Ketchulis Wildlife Overcrossing. It's the first one built on an interstate in the state of Washington. This bridge is 150 feet wide. There is soil on it. There are eight foot high sound walls so that animals can't jump off and it, it protects from the sound and animals feel safe. The first time I was on the overcrossing, I honestly was blown away. If I'm thinking like an animal, it made me feel like, yeah, I would want to use that. And what we're learning in just two years is that that is definitely true. Animals like the overcrossing, and they like the undercrossings. One of the really cool things is we get to see all these interactions. We'll have a coyote crossing and the elk chase it out. The species we've gotten so far to use the crossing structures are deer, elk, bobcat, coyote, raccoon, mountain beaver, pine marten. We think we got a fisher as well.
mountain lions were present on either side of I-90 just waiting to cross. We knew it was gonna happen at some point because they follow deer and elk populations. And it was really exciting this year when we found that the cameras were showing a mountain lion. It was great because this year it happened. This was our first time we'd gotten mountain lions on the crossing structures. And the species we're waiting on are black bear. We have cameras and bears are on either side. They're just getting ready. We also in the future are looking for wolverines to use these crossing structures. We've also put up our wildlife exclusionary fence and what we've seen is a, a drop in numbers of wildlife getting onto the roadway. They also guide wildlife to the different structure areas. That's what people always ask me, Brian, if you build it, will they come? And I said, yeah, they'll come because we'll funnel them to the, those safe crossings. One of the things I really appreciate about the Washington Department of Transportation is their creativity and innovations, trying to solve some of these problems. We're trying to build habitat within these crossing structures to mimic the natural habitat. We want them to see this seamless transition where they're coming out of this old growth forest and it seems the same all the way through. When you restore a habitat, you want to bring in the similar species that are in the area. One of the successes of a project is you use the native plants that are in the area. They're already adapted to those conditions. The planning is critical in a project like this. You can't just go to any grocery store, pick up a plant, and just expect that it's gonna survive. We needed to map the species that we needed for the project, collect the seed, have the seed processed, have the seed then go to a nursery where we can get containerized plants. Once they're developed into the containerized plants, then our contractors will go to the nurseries, pick up the plants, and then bring them to a staging area. I think this last phase that we planted last year, which included the overcrossing, 80,000 plants. In one of the previous phases of the project, there's a wetland complex that we refer to as Townsend Creek because Townsend Creek runs through it. It's been one of the most successful wetland restorations that I've seen so far. Townsend Creek at the site where we removed a 10-foot box culvert from the old Sunset Highway prism. As you can see, the creek has reestablished itself nicely and the entire site is looking very natural. When we initially planted the area, most of the plants were maybe three feet tall. When I went in last two weeks ago, the plants were taller than I was. The site has only been here for four years. Look at this place. see the species that you hoped would do well and they're actually very successful. They're thriving in where we put them. There had been deer and elk pretty much already moving through this area prior to the plants coming. So when we put the plants in, it was like a smorgasbord for them. Seeing the footage from the cameras showing animals eating my plants, it's knowing that you've put the right plant in the right place at the right time. Okay, can I just say, 
I get giddy. I mean, honestly, I just get giddy. In the early parts of this project, a lot of the data that we needed to find out what animal species were using these areas, what the current status of the native plant populations were, a lot of that data came from Central Washington University. One of the great things about Central Washington University is that they are primarily focused on the low mobility species. Being in an old growth forest ecosystem, we have small mammals, amphibians, reptiles, mollusks, insects, and fish species. Early in this project, people stepped back and said, as part of the changes to the Interstate 90, we need to have ecosystem connectivity. They looked to Central Washington University and said, there's a bunch of expertise. How can they contribute to the project? How can they be brought in? So we have Dr. Paul James, who's a fish biologist. So he's looking at the movements of fishes. So that includes also the endangered bull trout, which is in this area. And then we have Dr. Christina Ernest, who works on small mammals, and her work ranges from small terrestrial mammals like mice and voles, and now even look at the movements of bats in the area. My own work has been on reptiles and amphibians. We're looking at radio tracking of western toads in the area. Okay, hey, just dig down. She must have buried herself oh, quite well. Oh, like there you go. This is the first toad that we've radio tracked using one of the new crossing structures. So it crossed completely under I-90 and came through to the other side. One of the species that's really interesting in this area is the coastal giant salamander. It's an endemic to the Pacific Northwest, and it's an aquatic salamander that gets really large. It can be you know, six or eight inches long, so it's quite a large salamander, but it lives in these mountain streams. So what does a coastal giant salamander need to be able to cross under I-90. The salamanders do really well in the mountain streams up here. The culverts, however, were not good for the salamanders. So in Price Creek, for example, one of our best studied creeks, there was a massive concrete box culvert. And it was a few meters wide. You, know, you could walk a bunch of people through it. It was quite long because it had to go under a divided interstate. But the salamanders just would not move through it. So we, what we did is we went in and we marked a whole bunch of animals. We had 51 marked coastal giant salamanders, some of those north of Interstate 90, some of those south of Interstate 90. And we monitored them for three years and we didn't see a single individual cross through that concrete box culvert. It just was not suitable habitat for them. I think they just felt too exposed. There's no place to hide. When they did the mitigation work, construction came in, they took that box culvert out and put a bridge in instead. So they built an artificial stream bed, placing rocks and logs to mimic the natural streams in the area. Three days later, we saw our first adult coastal giant salamander move into that artificial stream bed. It's almost like they were just waiting to cross I-90. And so just immediately moved in, into the habitat. They also have records of individuals moving from the south side to the north and from the north side to the south and again, permanently residing in their new habitat. So we've connected two populations that were completely separated. We now have gene flow between them. Here we can study one really interesting endemic species and understand again, how it plays a role in the ecosystem and how connectivity is important to that particular species. We have students out here working with us, learning the techniques, seeing the animals, seeing what a mitigation can do. They've done their master thesis on the different wildlife that use this corridor. So it was just another home run on, on this project of working with partners and helping educate the community. I think as people cross Snoqualmie Pass, maybe these last couple years, there hasn't been a lot of work going on and thinking maybe we're done here at the wildlife overcrossing, but we're not. We still have another seven and a half miles to work on. The next phase will construct the new wildlife overcrossing on the east side of the mountains. It will add an additional lane in each direction as well as rebuild the existing lanes. And then we'll have lots of undercrossing structures. We're really excited about those because we already know that we've got mountain goat on both sides. Research has shown that they've been isolated by I-90 for a long time. And we'll have mountain goats that come all the way over from the Green River and they can't get across. 
So we're pretty excited because we know that they are just ready to use these crossing structures that are gonna be built. As we start construction again, I just would like to remind folks that we'll be back on the roadway. Our contractors, crews, my people from the, the Department of Transportation, Central Washington students doing studying. Give our people a break and make sure that you're driving the speed limit and you're paying attention to your surroundings. Please do not be on your cell phone while you're driving through our work zone. All our people have families too, and they want to go home and see them at night. This is really exciting for, for us as researchers to come into an area and to see the changes take place, to see the improvements take place, and to quantify and measure that and demonstrate to everyone that this is working. With the I-90 project, we took a holistic approach to trying to connect these ecosystems, hydrology, plants, soils, and a diversity of crossing structures, and focused on all those different habitats we have in the project area. The partnership that we've developed with Washington State Department of Transportation is probably one of the most unique partnerships I've been involved in. I don't think there's probably a soul in Washington who hasn't been affected by this project in one way or another. A lot of people will ask me, how do you make this happen? And I have to say that the credit goes to Washington Department of Transportation and their collaboration. And they brought in everybody, Kittitas County, State Parks, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, EPA, Army Corps of Engineers, Department of Ecology. It was very impressive. We've had tremendous support from a whole lot of partners from day one. In fact, we had to fix our landscape level problem first, and we had Conservation Northwest, Forterra, Sierra Club, everybody under the sun working with us to acquire lands and shore up this landscape. If you were to draw a string diagram and start connecting the dots of the different things that were done on this project, whether it was working with non-governmental agencies like Mountain Sound Greenway, which connected back to Central Washington University, which connected to the U.S. Forest Service. So it wasn't just the Department of Transportation that made it happen. It's all those groups, all their interconnections, all the, the funding that was provided by our legislature, it truly is a state project. When we started this project, there was a lot of lines on paper, a lot of meetings, a lot of talking to the public, talking to our legislative folks. And as the project progressed, you just wonder, is it ever gonna to come to fruition? When the day came that we were setting the arches on the project, it really kind of hit home that this is gonna happen. And when you come up here every summer and you see the plants growing and you talk to project partners and you see the, the videos from our, our wildlife monitoring team and, and you get invited to other states to talk about this project, all wanting to know how, how we did it. I mean, it's, it's a great feeling. And this is gonna be something that our whole state can be proud of and see every time they cross the Snoqualmie Pass and know that we did the right thing to making not only road improvements, but environmental improvements for future generations to come.